tragic end to what whites came to call the Great Sioux Uprising, and it marked the beginning of the exile of a people. Major funding for the Dakota conflict is provided by the St. Paul Companies, Minnesota's oldest business corporation, in celebration of its 140th anniversary. Additional funding is provided by the Minnesota Humanities Commission in cooperation with the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Minnesota State Legislature. One of the tragic ironies of the hanging at Mankato in 1862 is that it occurred within the same week that the Emancipation Proclamation was issued freeing the slaves by Abraham Lincoln. The great emancipator himself oversaw the whole process and that makes the ironies all the more cruel. I think that the two most tragic chapters in American history have to be the slave trade in the South and the Holocaust of the American Indians in the West. And those two chapters came together in a tragic way at Mankato in 1862. Mihunkabi, Bashichi Pikehena, a Machbi a Tanka Yachid, we Hinapi Ketaha, a Hinapi. Makocha Ate Akahbe, Boshiche Edwai, Ka, Miite Etaha Temani Makashta, Michashta Duze. In the midst of the Civil War, newspapers North and South reported of a terrible Indian massacre in the remote state of Minnesota, of families, women and children, murdered in their homes. For years, white settlers told stories of the Red Savages and their depredations on innocent people. 1862. Dakota people still hold close to them the memory of that year. In 1862, the lives of the people changed and would never be the same. For years, they had gone along with the whites, believing their promises, watching their children go hungry. The Dakota name for white people is Washichun. It means, takes the fat. On the 8th of June, 1851, a young artist by the name of Frank Blackwell Mayer boarded the steamship Excelsior in St. Louis, Missouri, bound for the city of St. Paul and the Minnesota Territory. There he would witness the signing of a great treaty between the federal government and the eastern tribes of the Dakota Nation. In six bound sketchbooks, Mayer recorded his journey, a journey that took him a world away from his native Baltimore. As we neared Lake Pepin, we first had intimation that we were emerging in a new region. On one side, civilization had advanced, and the log cabin and neat frame of the New England settler looked over the river to an Indian village where council smoke is still seen. Frank Blackwell Mayer. The village was called Kapoja, which in Dakota means traveling light, for the people moved with the seasons and the food supply. Life was a struggle, and a Dakota lived for the good of the people if he was to live at all. The chief, Little Crow, is a man of some 45 years of age and of a very determined and ambitious nature, but withal exceedingly gentle and dignified in his deportment. His face is full of intelligence when he is in conversation, and his whole bearing is that of a gentleman. Little Crow's Dakota name was Taoya Te Duta, which means his Red Nation, a name which carried great responsibility. His people were Bidewa Kantuan Dakota and their neighbors, the Wahpekute. On the edge of the plains near the Big Stone Lake lived the Sisetua and the Wahpetua. The four bands would come to talk with the whites. The whites called them the Sioux, but it's a word that means snake. The true name is Dakota, which means the allies. I fixed my mind upon the old chief's daughter. Her name is Spirit in the Moon. 
So I took ten blankets, one gun, five gallons of whiskey and a horse, and went to the old chief's lodge and laid them down and told the old people my errand and went off home. The third day I received word that my gift had been accepted. She came for to be my wife or companion as long as I choose to live with her. Philander Prescott. Philander Prescott, like many fur traders, married a Dakota woman and was accepted as one of the family. By marriage, a trader could have the business of an entire Dakota village, even Henry Hastings Sibley of the powerful American Fur Company married the daughter of a chief and had a child by her years before he married a white woman. In truth, my brother the beaver does everything to perfection, a native hunter once said. He makes for us kettles, axes, knives, and gives us food without the trouble of cultivating the ground. Many Dakota felt the same, and this new way of living seemed to make life easier. Since the time of Thomas Jefferson, fur traders had been encouraged by the government to generate large debts from Indians. Eventually, Indian leaders would be persuaded to give up their lands to pay off the debt. And in Minnesota, if the Dakota agreed to a treaty, the traders knew they could settle their accounts at a substantial profit. June 20th, 1851. This morning at sunrise, we are landed at Traverse de Sioux, a beautiful spot where the treaty is to be held, being an inclined expanse of prairie nearly surrounded by a band of the river. And here we pitch our tents and await the arrival of the Red Republicans, the St. Paul Pioneer. Up the winding Minnesota River came an eager delegation of white officials, traders, and missionaries ready to deal. They brought with them cattle to supply great feasts, and people wondered how so much champagne ever found its way to the wilderness. But the stakes were high, nearly 24 million acres of Dakota land. They knew the Sisituan and Wahpetuan had suffered a hard winter, and if they would sign a treaty, the other tribes would be forced to negotiate. <laughs> A great host gathered for the meeting. There were contests of sport and celebration as people renewed their friendships. Owning the land was a strange idea to the Dakota people. Yet they knew the whites were coming like locusts on the trees. The people had already sold their land east of the Mississippi. Now the whites wanted the land to the west. Leading the delegation was Alexander Ramsey, the territorial governor of Minnesota. Young and ambitious, Ramsey's political future was riding on a successful treaty. He relied on the traders. Their kinship with the Dakota was a powerful influence. By 1850, Henry Sibley had boasted, the Indians are prepared to make a treaty and such a one as I may dictate. Sibley's boast became reality as the Sisituan and Wahpetuan signed the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux on July 23rd. 1851. The talks moved downstream to Minidota, and for two days the leaders of the Bidewa Kantoan and Wakpekuta would not sign anything. They sat and smoked their council pipes. Finally, Tao Yate Duta stood and faced the council. These men sit still and say nothing, he said, but you fathers are the cause of its being so. They speak of some money that is due them. We will talk of nothing else if it is until next spring. The treaty commissioners grew angry. The great father would come with 100,000 men, they said, and drive you off to the Rocky Mountains. They were met with silence. At last, the price was raised. And though there was still argument, Tao Yate Duta stepped forward and signed his name in big letters. The Dakota agreed to give up their lands in return for a reservation, assistance for schools, farms, and trades, and yearly payments in gold and food. Their new home would be 10 miles on either side of the Minnesota River, from Lake Traverse to just west of the Cottonwood River. They were also promised a large sum of money to move their villages and to settle their affairs with the traders, 500 
$1,000. The traders claimed most of that money, and they were determined to get it. At the treaty signing, they set up a second table and made the chief sign a paper which allowed the government to pay the traders directly. I am not a white man. I do not know how to read and write, said one chief. They pulled me by the blanket and made me sign another paper. It was not explained to me at all. The money would never touch Dakota hands. There were laws that prohibited large payoffs to fur traders. This had happened time and time again. And the federal government finally decided we must put a stop to it, so they passed a law that said you cannot write into an Indian treaty any kind of a major payoff to Indian traders. So those were the directives that Ramsey worked under, and of course, uh, he fully intended to ignore both of them. As Frank Mayer left for St. Louis, his sketchbooks full, settlers started moving across the Mississippi. In Washington, the Senate struck out the article of the treaty giving the Dakota a reservation in Minnesota. The Senate decided the Dakota could just move farther west. The Dakota could not believe it. Dakowaji tunkashina e chu okihi oas upahipi ka witaya tinta ed akichita o e unhedepi ka unkutepi kte wapahasha. The Dakota would never sign any piece of paper that left them without a home, so Ramsey had to save the deal. He discovered the president could let the Dakota keep their reservation for five years, which he agreed to do. But Ramsey still needed Dakota approval in writing, saying they didn't actually own the land. Sibley and the traders marshaled all the support they could find among their Dakota relatives. No one knows what promises were made, but enough signatures were found and the treaties approved. A year later, the U.S. Senate brought Alexander Ramsey up on charges of fraud, but he was cleared, and the Dakota slowly made their way to the Minnesota River Valley and their new home. After the treaty business was all over, I was taken sick. The Indians said it was a judgment upon me. Good Road in particular said he wished I would die. Philander Prescott. The news of the treaty exhilarates our town. We behold now, clearly, in no remote perspective, like an exhibition of dissolving views, the red savages with their teepees, their horses, and their famished dogs, fading, vanishing, dissolving away, and in their places, a thousand farms with their fences and white cottages and waving wheat fields and villages and cities crowned with spires. The St. Paul Pioneer. White settlers flooded into the territory. New towns sprang up almost overnight. Towns with names like Red Wing, Mankato, and Shakopee, all names of departed Dakota chiefs. In 10 years, 160,000 Yankees and Europeans rolled into Minnesota, clearing timber, plowing up fields, and fencing off their claims. Dear sister, don't worry about us. We are living in peace as one family in our village. This helping each other is one of the finest things. That's why we're making such progress here. Cattle raising gives us the least trouble. After milking the cows in the morning, they are driven into the pasture. In the evening, they return by themselves. You don't have to work yourself into a humpback as in Germany. Your brother, Sebastian May. At the mouth of the Cottonwood River, a small group of Germans drew up the town of New Ulm, Minnesota, sent by German immigration societies in Chicago and Cincinnati. They were a hardy lot, weren't in much hurry to embrace English, and they seemed to keep to themselves. And one of the first things they did was to build a brewery. <laughs> 
The Dakota called the Germans the bad speakers, and many felt they were not good neighbors. They did not learn Dakota words, did not share gifts and food, and some were building their farms on land promised to the Dakota. A diversity of opinion exists in regard to the interpretation of the Treaty of 1851. It appears to be the opinion of the old settlers that the southeast boundary line of the reservation is from four to five miles further west than the Madewakantawan Indians claim, and many settlers have already located on said disputed grounds. Francis Bosson, Minnesota Secretary of State. Government surveyors drew up new borders to allow the farms to stay. 8,000 Dakota people were now concentrated in the villages along the Minnesota River. The four tribes were to be served by two agencies, providing craftsmen and teachers. But the promises in the treaties were not kept very well. Omaka yohi mazaska ota yuachuk te ka ate ichuk a iaza iaya. Mazaska wanjini ahi. Shina ota yuachuk ta keapi. Atehena humakia na ake iaza hiuyapi. Mini huka chistinawa in hamahi. Taku de na on ichante ma shija. Ne tratanka naji. Most of the food shipments rarely made it past St. Paul, and what food did come was usually spoiled. I will leave these bones of my people on the prairie, one chief said. And some day the great spirit will look the white man in the face and ask him what has become of his red brother. In the strains of this familiar old hymn was heard an unfamiliar tongue. Working in the Dakota language, missionaries Stephen R. Riggs and Thomas S. Williamson began a small enclave of Christian Dakota. They called their missions the Hazelwood Republic and Pajutazi, or Yellow Medicine. And they worked in earnest to change Dakota religion and culture. At the reservation, the general opinion was that all who changed their dress must change their religion. And Little Crow assigned this as the reason for doing neither, saying he would not give up his medicine sack, gourd shell, and armor, because he wished, when he died, to go to the same place where his fathers are. To this, Superintendent Cullen replied that he might retain all these and worship what and how he pleased if he would only have his hair cut and put on a hat and pantaloons. But this only convinced Little Crow of his ignorance. Thomas S. Williamson. The Dakota people were reluctant to leave their spiritual ways, which were the very fabric of their lives. They saw that the missionaries cared about them, but only as long as the Dakota would change. Although less than three years have elapsed since the first attempt to change the condition of the Sioux from hunters to agriculturists, there are now over 200 families located in comfortable houses who have abandoned their roving habits and are dependent upon agriculture pursuits instead of the chase for subsistence. Of this, there are 50 who, were they white, would be termed industrious, thrifty farmers and good citizens. Joseph R. Brown. Joseph Renshaw Brown was a former trader, whiskey seller, newspaper editor. He was also the Sioux agent for the upper and lower agencies. Brown had married a Dakota woman, had a large family, and probably knew more about the Dakota than any agent before him. And he was determined to turn the Indians into self-sufficient farmers. His efforts served to divide the Dakota. Dakota Toye, Gaumada Kotaki, 
ka iashita naku iwichakyap. Wabadit haka. Went out to see the country along the Minnesota River. A beautiful country, too good for Indians to inhabit. Lieutenant Timothy Sheehan. Washington, D.C., Saturday, March 13, 1858. The Washington Evening Star reported that 26 fine and stalwart Sioux from Minnesota arrived in our fair city to meet with the great father, President James Buchanan. The Dakota delegates weren't feeling so stalwart after six days of train travel. They boarded W.P. Chandler's coaches and were conveyed to Mrs. Mayer's Union Hotel, where the proprietor encouraged their drumming and singing. Good for business, she said. Indian delegations to Washington were meant to impress native peoples with the power of the white government. In the winter of 1858, there were delegates from 13 Indian nations in the city at one time. The delegates were taken to military parades and artillery demonstrations. They were taken to the theater and shown off at parties. Officials found the chiefs easier to deal with away from their homes and the influence of their young men. On May 24, 46 days later, the real purpose of their trip was made clear. Commissioner of Indian Affairs Charles E. Mix told the Dakota chiefs that their five-year lease had expired and the government wanted all the land north of the Minnesota River, half their reservation. They would be moved south of the river to live on 80-acre plots doled out to individual families. The Dakota were shocked to find they owned nothing. When Tal objected, the commissioner told him he was acting like a child. In the end, the Dakota signed the treaty. By that time, they had been kept from their homes for four months. They wished to go home. The amount to be paid for their land was promised at $1.25 an acre. Congress later dropped the figure to 30 cents. And when all was done, the traders took all the money. As soon as the Indians receive their money each year, the traders surround them, saying, You owe me so much for flour. Another says, You owe me so much for sugar. And the Indian gives it all up, never knowing whether it is right or not. I saw a poor fellow one day swallow his money. I wondered he did not choke to death, but he said, They will not have mine, for I do not owe them. Sarah Wakefield. We pass by the Mission Chapel and several civilized Indian houses where the squaws are in the fields seated on a platform above the tops of the grain engaged in the very interesting occupation of scarecrows, Edwin Lawton. In August of 1862, Adrian E. Bell, a St. Paul photographer, and his assistant Edwin Lawton traveled upriver anxious to record the work of civilization among the Dakota. They found the new agent, Thomas J. Galbraith, busily recruiting men to take south to the war. He was also dealing with some very hungry, very angry people. Cutworms destroyed last year's corn crop, followed by a hard Minnesota winter. Since the whites moved in, deer and game had all but disappeared. The treaty payment was late. The traders laid claim to the money, and this time, they clamped off credit. On August 4th, Sisetua and Wachpetua warriors broke into the food stores at the upper agency and took a little food. There were 5,000 people near starvation, but Agent Galbraith refused to release the food because he knew that their hunger would force them to honor the traders' claims. A council was gathered. <laughs> Unkichupe, unkokihepishne, 
Ote ne čapekta, ote maza pehe ota. Ote o judahe. Maza pehe etaha ote unak upekta i čavarape. We čapeke hena ote hedape, ki ha ote i čupekte. A ki ampekte šne. He čano šne ke ha unke čapekte. To ha we čašta ota ape, he ha o čiapekte. The trader Andrew Jackson Myrick turned away from the council in disgust. He said, so far as I am concerned, if they're hungry, let them eat grass or their own dung. Everything was silent as Myrick's words were told in Dakota. The council arose and left in anger. The people were like tinder to a spark. On Sunday, August 17th, four young men of Shock Pei's band had been hunting north of the reserve. They were standing in a farmer's hen house. They argued whether to take the eggs. I guess somebody got pushed in the corner and there was a setting hen on her eggs and he stepped on the hen and broke the eggs and the hen started to cackle. And of course, to the lady heard it, so she comes out and sees his Indians in there. She would run back in and brought out a broom or whatever kind of a broom that they used to have tied together. She come out with that and, and hit the Indians over the head. They, they all laughed. She didn't hit them all, she just hit the one guy and he, he ran. So then all the others laughed. <laughs> you let a woman <laughs> chase you around with a broom. <laughs> That's that's funny. So he goes back and he killed that woman. And that's how, that's how it started. That night, over a hundred Dakota warriors descended on the brick house of Taoyate Duta. Four of their men had killed a white family. Now is the time they argued to strike. The payments are late. Our people are starving. Now is the time for war. Tao Yate Duta disagreed. He thought the idea foolish and refused to help them. Someone in the crowd called him a coward. His son, Woi Nape, remembered his words. Tao Yate Duta he kiksape. Wako kipishni. Ta wachit eze. Zuya wichashta. Sitch eche se ya umpe. Sitch echa se wizduk chape. Chunk ase ha we on paka, henana wa papa ya umpe, tatanka ota picta, wanana wa ninya, wa yanka po. Wa shicho hena pipsipsina yeche nina wa we hang yape. Ota o ahiopi, which ota which aktepi, o kihepe. Wa shicho ye hena kazia picta, wa jiakte, kia ihupika o as uktepikte. Ne ishtaki shotawuda. We chashta ya tape, wahadaka, oya kihishne, nakune, no repe kemene, umiena, yae, yeche takuna na ya opishne. Zuya we chashta, sitch echa yeche, we duk champe, shunk to oke echa. Wote hadacha, mashtincha. Teb which aya behe, yeche oas net apekte. Ta oya te duta, wak oki pishne. Kitch e nit apek. On the morning of August 18th, James Lind, the clerk at Andrew Myrick's store, quietly left his writing. He'd been troubled by a premonition all morning. He stood in the east doorway and was shot down. He was the first to die. Painted Dakota warriors descended upon the lower agency and killed as many traders as they could find. Andrew Myrick jumped from a second-story window and tried to escape. He was shot and killed. His mouth was stuffed with grass. At Fort Ridgely, Captain John Marsh gathered 46 men and marched toward the agency. He ignored the warnings of terrified people running the opposite direction, but ordered his men to the double quick. He and his men were ambushed at the Redwood Ferry Crossing. Marsh drowned, trying to escape. Now in command of Fort Ridgely was Thomas P. Gear, an 18-year-old lieutenant left with 30 men and a case of the mumps. 
Gear sent a hastily scratched, ink-blotched letter to Governor Ramsey pleading for help while war parties swept through the valley. The German settlement of Milford was built on land claimed by the Dakota people. Vengeance was swift and terrible. Warriors killed over 50 whites. The Dakota fought in the traditional way. All were enemies. If captives were taken, they were the women and children. I could not go without first seeing my husband. I went to him and found him fallen over his side, probably having died without a struggle. I could see no blood about him. I kneeled down beside him, and there in the tall grass, alone with the dead, I took my last farewell of poor John, expecting soon to follow him. Levina Eastlick. When the uprising happened, of course, the, the Dakota were split. I mean, some didn't know whether they wanted to fight. Others were thought, well, I want to die like a man and not die here like an animal uh, because they were starving. Governor Ramsey now turned to his old friend Henry Sibley. Sibley had no military experience, but he knew the Dakota and their language. He would lead a 1,400-man army to crush them. Bolstered with reinforcements, mixed blood recruits, armed refugees, the number of Fort Ridgely defenders rose to 180. The Dakota attacked twice in three days, with as many as 400 men coming from all sides. The fort's five cannons finally drove them back, the fighting ending in a thunderstorm. Ironically, the gold for the payment was hidden in the fort. It arrived 24 hours too late to make any difference. The entire country was completely panic-stricken. The settlers fled from 10 to 30 miles according to the height of their excitement and stopped in some deserted house whose inhabitants, in like excitement, abandoned their homes and so on, like the waves on the sea, each falling where the other had risen from. Adrian E. Bell. Panic emptied the Minnesota River Valley. At the upper agency, a Dakota named John Otherday gathered settlers and missionaries and set out across the prairie. Among them were the photographers, E. Bell and Lawton, with glass negatives in tow. They were running for their lives. August 23rd. Having hidden his family in a grove of trees, a man named Myers swam the Cottonwood River and ran for New Ulm, arriving just in time for the biggest pitched battle of the war. Six hundred warriors swept down the terraced slopes toward the town. The defenders fought from street barricades, while 1,200 unarmed people huddled in basements like sheep in a cattle car. The fight was at times desperate, fighting hand to hand, but the German townsfolk held on. When nighttime fell, all the buildings beyond the barricades were set ablaze. The next morning, 190 buildings lay in ashes. Only the few blocks they defended stood in the center of town. And though the battle was won, there was no food and ammunition was low. So New Ulm was evacuated. 2,000 people made the journey down the valley and many never returned to Minnesota. Desolation reigns. The potato fields are undug. The crows are holding high carnival over the ungathered cornfields. What the Indians think they will do for a living next winter, I don't know. Perish they must. <laughs> 
and they will have the consolation to know that they have accomplished their own destruction. Stephen R. Riggs. After the fighting came an awful silence. Circling crows signaled burial crews of more bodies as Sibley's army moved forward. Not knowing the strength or numbers of his enemy, Sibley moved slowly, taking days to travel what normally took hours. The public was outraged. Governor Ramsey, for God's sake, put some live man in command of the force against the Sioux, and let Sibley have a hundred men or thereabout in his undertaker's corps. Jane Gray Swisshelm. Jane Gray Swisshelm was the editor for the St. Cloud Democrat. While she was a vocal champion for women's rights and freeing the slaves, Miss Swisshelm had no charity for the Dakota. Every Sioux found on our soil deserves a permanent homestead. Six feet by two, shoot the hyenas, exterminate the wild beasts, and make peace with the devil and all his hosts sooner than with these red-jawed tigers whose fangs are dripping with the blood of innocence. On August 28th, Sibley finally arrived at Fort Ridgely. It had been ten days since the violence began. The Dakota moved up the valley thinking the white soldiers would attack. When the attack didn't come, a party returned to their village to retrieve belongings. Across the river, high on the prairie, they saw one of Sibley's burial parties moving away toward Birch Coulee. Two hundred warriors were chosen to follow them. The attack began at dawn. Dakota piki tayan idu hapi. Kauki chizeki wash akina. Bini o chimpi keha peji en laos dohan wiyapi. The soldiers were pinned down for over 30 hours. The sounds of battle were heard at Fort Ridgely, some 16 miles away. Sibley finally arrived to rescue his men. 17 died, and dozens more were wounded. The Sioux Indians of Minnesota must be exterminated or driven forever beyond the borders of the state. The public safety imperatively requires it. Justice calls for it. The blood of the murdered cries to heaven for vengeance. Governor Alexander Ramsey. Sisetouan and Wakpetouan chiefs like Maza Shah and Tatanka Nanji refused to help those who fought. Some of their men ran off to fight, but they stood firm. Taoyate Duta would find no more help for this cause. From his own ranks, members of a growing peace party were sending messages to Sibley to bring an end to the fighting. Sibley's army was now at Bidet Chan, Wood Lake. The Dakota mustered their forces for one last attack. They would strike at dawn as the enemy broke camp. We are now pay itaha tanta, obadaya opta, champamia pi topa ona akichi tahiupi. Most of the Dakota were too far out to fire a shot. Chief Makato was killed by a cannonball. It is said the cannonball was nearly spent and he was not afraid of it. The Dakota were defeated. As warriors returned, they released over a hundred white prisoners to those who wanted peace. Some leaders like Wabisha and Wambidi Tonka stayed to surrender. But Taoyate Duta and his people left toward the plains. I was told to hurry and change my clothes for my own as the soldiers were coming, and it would be wrong for them to see me in a squaw dress. At last we were ready and we left our teepee and my Indian friends who had protected me for six weeks. The old women shook hands and kissed me and said, you are going back where you will have good warm houses and plenty to eat, and we will starve on the plains this winter. Sarah Wakefield. Sarah Wakefield was the doctor's wife from the upper agency. She and her baby had been captured and protected from harm by a Dakota man named Chaska. As Sibley's army entered the camp, 
she convinced Chaska to give himself up. It is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts and by no means as people. John Pope. Union General John Pope had just been humiliated at the Second Battle of Bull Run. His new assignment was to put down the Dakota Rebellion. Sibley had promised the Dakota he would only punish those who killed settlers. Pope had other ideas. Under the veil of darkness, the soldiers surrounded the Indian camp, closed in upon it and took all the men prisoners, brought them in and shut them up under guard. Chains were then forged upon their ankles. Side by side, the right foot of one was fastened to the left of another. Adrian E. Bell. Henry Sibley set up a military court to try the Dakota in Francois Labatt's store, although he was still unsure of his authority. Believing they would be treated as prisoners of war, the Dakota were proud to say they had fought in battles, but that was all that was necessary to prove their guilt. At one point, the prisoners were tried at a rate of one every ten minutes. The press criticized the commission as moving too slow, 392 Dakota men were tried, and 303 were condemned to die. In a column nearly three miles long, 1,700 mostly old men, women, and children were marched to Fort Snelling, guarded by three companies of soldiers. They were attacked by hostile crowds as they passed through the town of Henderson. I saw an enraged white woman rush up to one of the wagons and snatch a nursing Indian babe from its mother's breast and dash it violently upon the ground. The soldiers restored the papoose to its mother, limp and almost dead. It died a few hours after. The body was quietly laid away in the crook of a tree. I witnessed the ceremony, which was, perhaps, the last of its kind within the limits of Minnesota. Samuel J. Brown. The Dakota men were secured in a dark log prison in Mankato, a place they called Camp Lincoln. The president would be the one to sign the execution order. Abraham Lincoln asked if someone else could take this burden from him, but he was told he was the only one who could do it. The whites in Minnesota demanded that all should hang. On the night of December 4th, a mob of about 200 collected and made a march on the Indian prison, intent on lynching the prisoners. Luckily, a company of cavalry intercepted the mob. Sibley took the matter seriously, telling General Pope that it would take a thousand true men to protect the prisoners and doubted the present guards could be relied upon. In Washington, Abraham Lincoln assigned two clerks with the task of reviewing the trials of the 303 condemned Dakota. At first, Lincoln asked for them to list those guilty of molesting women but when they found only two, Lincoln had them look again, this time for those who killed civilians. The number rose to 38. When he reported to the Senate, he said he wanted to act not with so much clemency as to encourage another outbreak, but not with so much harshness as to be considered cruel. And so he compromised. Um, and, and in doing that, he was reaching, I think, a, a, a political decision about what he could do under the circumstances. By Christmas Day, 1862, the ringing of hammers had stopped. The gallows stood ready. The people of Mankato, Minnesota, attended services and gathered in their homes to celebrate Christmas. The execution would be the next day. A crowd of 3,000 had gathered to see how the Dakotas would meet their deaths. The gallows was built so that all would hang at one time together. But when they were walking up that steps there to, to the gallows, one Indian was walking up. Oh, they don't get back with seats and some cops in the gosh, they don't yak to be done. I said, we are quite cut us that took out the inona. I walk as you say, they are used to do. He was walking up. He goes, what's he saying? What's he saying? Nobody told these people what he was saying. What he was saying was, there's a 
bunch of us here that we never did nothing wrong, we never touched no, but here you're hanging us. But our Creator can see this. You're going to answer to this in the future. The 38 climbed the gallows and began to sing. They sang their death song and called out their names, saying, I am here, I am here. The drum was sounded three times and the rope was cut. still holding each other's hands. They were buried under a willow on a sandbar. That evening, physicians from as far as Chicago dug up the bodies for medical use. Among the executed was Chaska, the man who protected Sarah Wakefield. His captors assured Mrs. Wakefield he was hung by mistake. For the Bedewa Kantuan Dakota people, this place is where the world began. Here at Minidota, where two great rivers join together. Here, Ina, our mother the earth, gave birth to our ancestral grandmother and grandfather. The land is Wakan, sacred. For the Dakota, this was Eden. Here is where the whites built their Fort Snelling. Here is where they imprisoned the Dakota people. Tuktet Uyankapi at Nina Okashnia Uyankapi. Ukha Uya za Ata Iak, a Shichechakit Apista. Uchak Pinupa, Kokapaki, Uchinchana, a Hena Kunt Ek. Ukha Makatko Tonhe at Dakota Uchasta or Kewichapi. Nina Woyazak, a wot kind shicha, he on a anakiha, to a gikta he woaki ka washte, tiwa ka. According to uh, my grandfather, John Bluestone, they were burying people from the time the sun came up until it went down every day at the fort. So we don't know how many men died there, or at least I, I haven't been able to find the record that indicates the number of able-bodied men who died during the, that winter. In early April, 1863, the steamer Favorite passed the city of St. Paul without stopping. On board were the Dakota prisoners from Mankato on their way to prison at Camp McClellan in Davenport, Iowa. <laughs> The Davenport and the Northerner were also loaded with human cargo. The prisoners from Fort Snelling boarded at the levee, the citizens of St. Paul gave them a send-off with rocks and bottles. Dear Father, they expect to put us all on the same boat. If they do, I think it will be nearly as bad as the middle passage for the slaves. But then folks say they are only Indians. In the manifest of freight taken down by the northerner, they published 30 horses, 540 Indians. John P. Williamson. The Dakota people were taken to a new reservation called Crow Creek on the Missouri River. It was a barren place. Nothing would grow. There was very little rain, and what water was there was salty, unfit to drink. Chunky jak se hechia dokhe tuha. Dakota ki hachona umpi. 
Sao juha hu iak pemni, heche hu ki hena, snipik deshni. Wea ki hena, sao juha ki hena, akichita etaha i chupi, hea ke hena isto waniche, ni chokpi wa stewi. In the spring of 1863, Brigadier General Henry Sibley began a punitive expedition against hostile Indians into Dakota Territory. From the south, General Alfred Sully brought units from Nebraska and Iowa, the two forces to meet in a pincer movement to crush the Dakota between them. Things didn't go exactly as planned. The Dakota melted away before the oncoming armies with their mule trains and heavy wagons. There was little fighting to be found. At a place on the Dakota Prairie called Whitestone Hill, the long knives of Alfred Sully came upon the camp of a large Ehunktawa Dakota hunting party. If there were any Eastern Dakota in the camp, they were very few. I hope you will not believe all that is said of Sully's successful expedition against the Sioux. I don't think he ought to brag of it at all. He pitched into their camp and just slaughtered them. Worse, a great deal than what the Indians did in 1862. It is lamentable to hear how those women and children were slaughtered. It was a perfect massacre. And the worse of it, they had no hostile intention whatever. Samuel J. Brown. In Washington, Congress declared that Dakota had violated the treaties and therefore had no claims to any lands in Minnesota. The treaty payments were canceled and used to aid white victims of the conflict. In Minnesota, the state issued a notice for an increase in the bounty on Indian scalps. It was dangerous for a Dakota to stay in Minnesota. Even Taopi, who rescued many whites, had to carry walking papers to keep from being shot. For almost a year, Tao Yate Duta looked for allies on the plains. He had been to Fort Garry on the Red River to ask the British for help asking that they honor the alliance their people had made against the Americans in the War of 1812. When hope was exhausted, Tao Yate Duta returned to his homeland. He decided that to everything there was an ending. So he had given his medicine bundles for his son to carry, and together they traveled south. From his cornfield near Hutchinson, Minnesota, farmer Nathan Lamson shot at two Indians as they were picking raspberries. One was hit and mortally wounded. When Taoyate Duta lay still, Wowi Nape put new moccasins on his feet for the journey to the place of his ancestors and left his father's body. For his services, Nathan Lamson would receive a $75 bounty from the state of Minnesota. He received $500 more when it was learned the Indian was Little Crow. The scalp and remains of Tao Yate Duta were put on public display by the state. He was finally laid to rest in 1971. Taking refuge in Canada, Chief Shakpe and Medicine Bottle were drugged and spirited across the border to waiting American troops. Imprisoned at Fort Snelling, they were denied legal counsel, tried and hung on November 11, 1865. The Dakota people were divided and dispersed across the plains from the Missouri River to the Rocky Mountains. Others made the journey into what is now Canada, refugees streaming into places like Fort Garry and the middle settlement on the Red River. When hunger became too great, most submitted to reservation life. Today, Dakota communities range from Montana to Winnipeg, Nebraska and the Dakotas, and even Minnesota. Elders tell of the return to the Minnesota River Valley, of hiding in ditches, of singing hymns to keep farmers from shooting in their tents. The forced acculturation practiced in Minnesota was official government policy by the turn of the century. Government boarding schools and reservation life did much to change the Dakota, but we are still here and our culture is still alive. The Dakota conflict was the opening chapter in a 30-year struggle for the plains that continued with the Little Bighorn and ended at Wounded Knee.
It was the clash of two great cultures who at first found common ground, but then divided in fear, hatred, and misunderstanding. The Dakota in their prayers, Mitakuye Oyasin, we pray for all our relatives, for all living things. The elders say we must live our lives and make our choices for the next seven generations that the children might live. So let our young men, our women, and our children be made glad. And may peace subsist between us so long as the sun, the moon, the earth, and the water shall endure. Major funding for the Dakota conflict is provided by the St. Paul Companies, Minnesota's oldest business corporation, in celebration of its 140th anniversary. Additional funding is provided by the Minnesota Humanities Commission in cooperation with the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Minnesota State Legislature. To purchase a copy of this program, please call KTCA Video at 612-229-1253. The Dakota Conflict is a KTCA original production. We welcome your comments about the program. Please call our viewer comments line, 229-1432, or write us at KTCA, 172 East 4th Street, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55101. Toxic chemicals are turning Lake Superior into one of the Great Lakes Bitter Legacy. A National Audubon Society special, next. From teeming cities to remote tribal villages with strange and mysterious cultures, 